Today, photo assignment winners and a really cool new one. Hey everyone, Greg Cazillo from Cazillo.com. Welcome to another Keep Shooting Monday. Today I'm going to be talking about front versus rear curtain sync, archiving your images, and also marketing your photography. And I have one other question. Also, we have the high key assignment winners. Uh, this week, Think Tank actually has a free shipping offer. And you're going to still get $50 of free gear when you place an order. Use this link to place that order. Uh, Canon has released some uh, new uh, rebates on the 5D Mark III, 60, 70, and 60D, and also a new firmware for the 60D. Head over to this link to check those things out. Also, Nikon Hacker this week uh, has found a way to remove the 30-minute limit on the D5100 and D7000 bodies. Uh, if you want to try that out, I think it's really cool and something that I did not know is the, the restriction is not a hardware or a software restriction. It's actually because of the duties and tariffs that are placed on it when importing the cameras into the country. Supposedly video cameras have a higher tariff or a higher duty and they have to pay that uh, and that means that it's a higher price for you and me when we actually buy it. That's obviously a problem. So um, head over to this link if you want to try out, uh, although do be aware that that uh, firmware, the, if you load it in, it might break your camera. So just be careful, follow all the instructions. But uh, I think it's pretty cool that there are people out there that are, that are actually trying this stuff and that are uh, willing to kind of push the edge of it. I think it's really neat. A uh, couple other things here, a couple really nice photos from the International Space Station uh, featuring some Nikon cameras. This stuff is just really, really cool. Seeing the lights and the storms and the the space station itself and the way they rigged the cameras and all um, really some inspiring uh, really really cool photographs there um, lastly I wanted to mention this post actually about the Lightroom workflow and your keyboard shortcuts I am a huge fan of using keyboard shortcuts both in Lightroom as well as Photoshop I actually printed this out it's hanging by my desk and uh, so I can quick look at it refer to it See if it's something that, uh, you know, the shortcut that I should be using. Try and get better at it because it's only going to improve your workflow. Next, gazillion questions. Are you always shooting an aperture priority or mostly manual? Or it depends on what you're shooting. I shoot mostly manual. I'd say probably about 90% of what I do is in manual mode. The only time that I'm going to switch over to an aperture priority mode is, is if I'm shooting an event or I have light that's changing very quickly. So for example, if I'm out photographing, say, I don't know, say one of my horse show events or a car event or a, a run or something like that, like a sporting event or a baseball game, something like that, that's when I'm going to be on an aperture priority. Just because it's easier, it's quicker, you really can't be adjusting the settings on the camera that quickly. It's just impossible. You can't be paying attention to both the framing and the focus of the image as well as your exposure. So that's when the aperture priority comes in handy. Other than that though, I am going to be on manual mode. Any kind of a portrait, a wedding, uh, a lot of the events that I do, I'm on a manual mode with uh, usually a TTL or a manual in the flash. And again, that depends. I've, I've talked about that in the past of what mode I set my flash on depending upon what I'm doing. But uh, yeah, majority of the time, manual mode, and then here and there, I will use Aperture Priority. How do I market myself better besides a website and a car decal? I'm glad to hear that you have a website. I'm not glad to hear that you promote your services on your vehicle. I have never been a fan of that. I think it's tacky, and I also think that, in fact, I know that uh, the people out there are going to end up targeting your vehicle, stealing your equipment, just because you have this big, huge banner that says, hey, I'm a photographer, come steal my gear right on the side of your car. Uh, that might not happen tomorrow, it might not happen next week, but eventually you keep driving through the same town, the same person's gonna see you, gonna follow you, you're gonna park on a back street somewhere, or you're gonna be in the city somewhere, 
and your stuff's going to get stolen. And so I strongly suggest removing that and never putting the words, I'm a photographer in any shape or form on your vehicle. It's just not a good idea. As far as the marketing part, get out there, volunteer, find some good opportunities for you to either shoot big events, uh, maybe some kind of a free or a charity event. Those are always good. Other really nice ways to market and get, get some additional work is through groups like Latip and BNI. I'm actually a Latip member, uh, have been for about five or six years, something like that. Excellent group, it's a referral group. They refer business to you, you refer business to them. If there is not a chapter in your area, you can start one. Just look up latip.com, L-E-T-I-P.com and uh, get some additional information. Other than that, the chambers are also, uh, local business uh, chamber meetings, stuff like that are great ways to get your word out, get your name out. Uh, other than that, you just need to keep on working on your word of mouth, promote yourself on the web and social media as well as possible. And uh, any other ideas though, comment below. I'd love to hear what your ideas are for promoting your work. I'm an amateur photographer and want to know the best way to save digital images of a high resolution nature. You said something about not saving them to disk and was just wondering how or what is the best way to archive them. Jimmy, this actually is not that difficult. Uh, the number one way to archive your images in the highest resolution is to keep them in the native resolution of the camera, and that's your RAW mode. Start out with just the RAW mode. If you're editing in Lightroom, that's great. Save those XMP files to the, to, uh, as a sidecar file next to your RAWs and um, put them on multiple hard drives, and that's your archive, and you'll have that forever. If you can do an online backup, that's great as like a, a third or a fourth copy of your, all of your images. Maybe give a hard drive of images to a friend or put it in a safe deposit box. That's another good way. But that's really for the images that you're editing just in Lightroom and you're not really doing any retouching to or not a lot, you know, just when you're staying in there. But when you have to do some additional editing, say in Photoshop, that's where you want to save the PSD files. If you really, really are worried about it, go with a TIFF file. But I don't think Adobe is going anywhere. They're a pretty darn big company. And so the Photoshop document, a PSD format, is going to be around forever. It's going to be supported no matter what, I believe. So um, just the big thing I can say is constantly be watching what's going on in the industry. If uh, you're worried about something, maybe have a second set of files and you're really anal about it. Maybe have that second set of files, maybe in the DNG format. The only time I actually push some files over to DNG is if I want to save space. So for example, two weeks ago I photographed a, a five mile run and I had like a thousand photos or something like that. I blew them down to DNGs because they saved me half the space, maybe a little bit more. Instead of being, I don't know, like 30 or 40 gigs, it was less than 20 gigs for all those files. So that was able to save me a little bit of space. And uh, other than that, I actually do have another video coming up very soon where I have my backup and archive uh, settings and the way I do everything with, a, with hard drives and a whole nine yards coming up very soon. And so I'm going to be posting that and keep an eye out for it. Hey Greg, I'll be photographing in a martial arts class and it's dimly lit. I need to freeze shots of kicks, etc. I only have a D300S but I have some umbrella soft boxes, et cetera. If I were to use the flash soft boxes, et cetera, would be using rear curtain or front to freeze the shot. Front versus rear curtain sync is not gonna make a difference as far as freezing your image. Uh, the flash duration is actually really, really fast, something like 10 thousandths of a second or 15 thousandths of a second, depending upon how much um, power you're actually using. And so that's not what's going to free, the, the flash itself is going to freeze the shot no matter what. The front curtain sync is actually just um, putting, setting the flash off at the beginning of the exposure and then rear curtain sync is setting it off at the, towards the end of the exposure as the shutter is actually closing. So that's the difference in those. Um, as far as the right way to shoot this, uh, what I would be doing is probably keeping my shutter speed a little bit higher especially if it's very dimly lit, I'd be setting up my strobes and not only for the foreground, but you're also gonna to need to, lit, to light the background. So set up a, with a little bit lower ISO, say 400 or 200, set up your strobe, especially if you have studio lighting, um, like my mono lights that I have, then you'll um, be like the foreground, like the person, but also get some nice background. You need to put some flash or some background into the, uh, do something with that background. You don't wanna leave it 
bland and have a, like a real dark background or boring. I actually want to give it some interest. So that's where some additional flash back there is going to help. This also brings me to another point that I wanted to get across. I think a lot of beginning photographers spend way too much time thinking about just their settings. And when they're looking at images, they look at the settings. Oh man, the shutter speed was 200, okay, and 2.8, and you know, an ISO 400, and so I'm gonna set my camera for exactly that, and I should get this picture. And it does not work that way. The lighting is gonna be different, the, um, you know, the situation, the equipment, all those things are probably gonna be different. And so you need to pay attention when you're looking at photos, when you're studying photographs and learning your trade, you need to be paying more attention to the composition, the angle, the lighting of the image, uh, maybe the way that it was edited, that kind of thing. A lot, a lot less than the actual exposure settings. Obviously those are important, you, but you should be able to just look at a photograph and be able to almost guess those expo that exposure settings and you'll at least get to that point eventually. Now, the only way to kind of get to that point is to be able to study this stuff. Study your shutter speed, study your, your aperture, study your ISO, understand what they do, both independently and in conjunction with one another. You should be able to know right off the top of your head that when you go from f2.8 to 5.6, that that's two stops, and that you have half the amount of light Sorry, you have gone down a quarter of the amount of light. You've gone down two stops. So you've gone from 2.8 to f4 to 5.6. That's two stops left, which is a quarter of the amount of light from 2.8 to 5.6. You need to just know that off the top of your head without even thinking about it. And then vice versa, say you go from a shutter speed of say 2 50th a second down to a 60th. You know, again, that's two stops. You're quadrupling the amount of light. You know, double down to 1 1 25th and then double again down to the 160th. So understanding that stuff and knowing it in your head is super important, but don't study it as much on photos. Uh, study the composition, the light, the angle, that kind of thing, and then um, play with your exposure and understand them in general, and you're gonna be a better photographer. Last week in my Thursday video, I put up some photos and I talked through my thought process of photographing this 1935 Rio antique fire apparatus. The photos are actually gonna be used for a fundraiser for a local fire company. And so I'm going to, I've already gone that, gone through that, but this leads up to our new assignment. New assignment this week is going to be any kind of a vehicle, uh, whether it's your own car, an antique car, heck even throw in a train if you really had it, maybe a fire truck, anything like that. Give me the best photo. Uh, doesn't me matter if it's a one tiny little part of a vehicle or if it's the whole vehicle itself. You can put um, hot babes in there. You can do whatever you want. Make it really cool. Make it the very best image you can. Any kind of a car, any kind of a vehicle, uh, a, even if you really want to use a bus. You know, anything you find. Maybe a really cool old truck in the middle of a field, you know, in the evening with the cool light coming through. You know, any of that stuff will be really awesome. So uh, go out, shoot some of those. Make sure you get them up two Fridays from now, 5 p.m. And um, they have to be shot in the next two weeks. Uh, no older photos. And read all the rules before you post them. And I think that's it. So uh, yeah, have fun with this one. Should be a neat one. Give me a good vehicle shot. Can't, I dare you guys to give me like 10 of them that I just absolutely have to show. I can't wait. Can't wait. Last thing for today are our high key photo assignment winners. My number three photo was this photo from Paul. Um, I just love the composition and the way he has the trees really dark and the shadows coming towards you. Just has a really kind of eerie feeling. And uh, not only did he get the high key thing right, he did it outside instead of doing it in the studio, which is awesome and um, really cool image. You're number three, Paul. Uh, number two, classic studio shot. Love the angle. I love how you're looking right onto the glass and not down into it or down on the side. You're very, very low. That's from Victor. Love this photo. Love the bubbles in it. And just it looks like you just dropped it in, like you're ready to chug it down. You just got it, like the bartender just handed it to you. Love this photo. Number one this week is from, sorry, wrong one, uh, from Mark. 
It's actually a self-portrait, I guess. Uh, you can see the tripod. Um, the only thing that I would have done different with this photo is I would have had a little bit less of the black stuff there on the bottom and had more sky, a little bit more of the trees to kind of frame, a little bit of frame in a frame kind of a thing there. But other than that, I think this photo is awesome. I love the silhouette. Uh, the nice high key, the, you know, the background, but you still have a little bit of detail in the clouds. And um, this is one of those times where it's just a matter of paying attention, being inventive, being creative, paying attention to the light, seeing what's going on, and just have something kind of click in your head and then go and do it and execute. Very good execution here. Uh, one interesting thing is I'd have to guess he'd have to have two tripods or maybe he's out with a friend and fo photographed it. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more story about this and it's probably right here, but I'm not going to read it to you. I probably should have read it first, but um, really cool photo from Mark and he actually submitted a couple of them, but this was my favorite of the three. So uh, yes, Greg Cazillo, Cazillo.com. Get your assignment in. Any questions about today's show, of course, uh, put them down there and make sure you share and like the video. Thanks guys. Keep shooting. See you.